Thank you, MBIFL, for having us over. Um, be, uh, I'm just so happy to be with these three stalwarts. Uh, Alexandra, who I've met a few years ago and had many lovely conversations with, and one of the most beautiful human beings, and uh, an editor who's published so many gems. Uh, and Mr. Kannan, who I just uh, had the opportunity of interacting with now. He's published uh, great Tamil writers like Perumal Murugan, which is like uh, another gem in Indian literature. And Premanko, who's constantly uh, publishing a lot of um, literary fiction and uh, non-fiction and uh, fiction, right? So um, uh, on that note, I'd like to, um, uh, you know, Alexandra and I have been having a little chat over lunch yesterday. And um, she told me that, you know, she often connects with the writer. You know, she meets a person and then hears about their writing. And then it flows to the next level. Could you take us through that journey? Well, um, the thing about being an editor is it's an incredibly personal thing because although publishers like to pretend they know what they're doing, they really don't. And all you have is yourself and your response to work and to also to writers because for me it's always important to have the right kind of connection and I prefer to take on a writer having met that person and feeling that we can work together. Um, and usually, if you connect with the work, you can. Um, but I think, I think that, that for me, that's always been an important thing. But I've also quite enjoyed meeting writers in strange and unlikely places, rather than relying on agents to always send me work. And it's one of the reasons why I love going to literary festivals, because you bump into people, you start relationships. So there are, there are writers that I've met at literary festivals, Barbara Trapido was one, who came to me after we had, we had met at a, at a festival in Britain. And then another was the um, Indian writer Tishani Doshi, who I actually met at breakfast, in a bed and breakfast, um, in Hay on Wai. And I walked in to breakfast one early one morning um, with my husband, and there was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen sitting, eating a very large bowl of porridge. And we fell into conversation, and I felt this very strong connection with her. And um, in fact, her novel had been offered to a few places, and there ha hadn't been any interest in it. But I, I just... I asked to see it, I asked the agent to see it, and I felt that she and I could work together, and so we did. That's so lovely. Uh, and so, you know, there's some hope for writers who meet Alexandra, perhaps, but now I think you're a retired. Too late, Too yes. late, yeah. <laughs> she could probably recommend aspiring writers to somebody she knows, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kanan, so um, have you had similar experiences? How do you kind of uh, find your gems? Hello. Yeah. So um, most of the publishers we publish are publisher writers who approach us um, and ask, uh, can can we work together? And then if we like, um, we will read their work and then make a connection and then start working. That's one way to do it. But there have been some exceptions. Like in 1998, um, I I began reading the writings of uh, writer Paramal Murugan who's now my, one of my major authors. And I thought, you know, I really like this voice, uh, the way he writes about things, his scholarship and his honesty and all that. So then I wrote him a letter saying that I would like to come and meet you. And at that time, I had no, I mean, I had just started the publishing house. We were publishing two book, one book per year. So that was not my intention. But first I want to make him write for my magazine. We run a monthly magazine called Kala Choda. And so I told him that, why don't you, why don't we start working on a column together? You contribute on a column. So that's how that relationship started. And then slowly I publish, began publishing all his books. And now we have uh, total publishers. So when you publish in Tamil, that is one thing. But when, when you want to decide to take the right writer on to your rights catalog, uh, because that's not the same thing for language like Tamil, because first you have to 
then get an Indian English publisher to publish their works. And once you have the complete, well-edited manuscript at hand, then you can go and pitch the book at International Book Fest to other languages. So it's a long process. Sometimes it might take up to five years before a writer gets into your rights catalog. In those instances especially, then it's very, very important that you have a very good equation with the writer. You feel the writer trusts you and that you can trust the writer to make a long-term investment on the writer in terms of money and you know, labor that you put in to pitch them. So there it becomes even more important when you want to take the writer onto your rights catalog. That's such an important point, building trust, you know. So, um, Primanko, have, I mean, taking off on the same point, can you talk about your experiences? Have you ever kind of interacted with authors and taken them on, or how does it work with you, especially as someone who uh, is in part of the editorial team of such a large, India's, one of India's largest publishing houses, Penguin? So when Alexandra shared her experience, I said, oh, I love this, what she says. Because I also belong to the old school of publishing. And I used to be an editorial trainee much before, you know, I started looking into the business of publishing. And then there was, you know, a gap for a few years when I started working in a corporate because of my education. But yes, I think uh, the relationship between the author and the editor is amazing. It's a very special relationship. And... Uh, over a period of time, I've seen that, uh, uh, that the editor concern becomes the face of the publishing house. And uh, the author begins to trust the editor for each and everything. If there is a problem with the marketing or the sales or anything, your first point of contact is your editor. So I think that you know, in India, while literary agents are you know doing relatively well now direct commissioning plays a big role and i think that indian publishers love doing that and that's why we are in, in india english language publishing is very much delhi centric so if you visit khan market between 12:30 to 2 o'clock you will be able to figure out what who is publishing what because you will see all the big editors you know, writers, they are in, you know, loitering in various cafes, meeting people, or you go to IIC, India Habitat Center, you see that, you know, how enthusiastically the editors and the authors are meeting, discussing ideas, threshing out, you know, new possibilities. So it's very much a part of, an integral part of the bookmaking in India, I must say. You, you seem to be so, you know, there's that fantastic expression on your face when you say when you said that relationship between the author and the writer so what does it do to you personally when you meet an author who it's you know it's sticking with it's working with what is that process talk about those emotions and what comes to you well it's very difficult to capture that because you know i can feel that and i always you know the way publishing is emerging in the world you know at times it becomes very difficult to you know even to see a better possibility because the readership is at times you see that diminishing like anything. But chasing an idea, developing an idea is amazing. I work on non-fictions largely and I see that an abstract thing that I thought about it and perhaps in the very beginning I didn't even believe in that idea. And after a few years when I see the real thing, as I shared this I'm getting goosebumps this is amazing and when that book becomes a bestseller if it becomes a bestseller then the joy of that cannot be expressed in words I'm, it can be on only felt and I must say that you know uh, I'm privileged in that sense that uh, Penguin gives me that opportunity you know to interact with a lot of people so the idea is to create that space it's very important Lovely. Alexandra, you could probably add to this because, you know, uh, you've spoken about how uh, you published Abdul Razak and, you know, when he didn't win the award and then, you know, when the award came, how you felt. Could you kind of take us through that journey <laughs> and any other author also? Well, you'd it's like to speak very about? embarrassing for me yeah. to do yeah. that because he's in, in the audience. Oh. <laughs> 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 so... Um, uh, you know, I published him, I was really lucky to publish him for 23 years, something like that. Ah, we've got the drums. Um, uh, 
And he's always been incredibly highly regarded and got wonderful reviews. Um, but my one moment of fury was with the Booker Prize when we published Afterlives, which is just one of the great novels that I've ever published in my lifetime. And I was so sure, and I never am because I'm really superstitious about prizes, but I thought this time this is going to happen. And it didn't. And I, I've never felt such, such sadness, actually, professionally. Um, and, and then just a few months later, guess what? My, on my screen, I was having an online meeting because it was still in the days of COVID, and it, it flashed up on my screen, and I just burst into floods of tears. So there we are. It just shows that wonderful things can happen in life. And I saw those emotions outpouring on Facebook, which is how <laughs> we had some tears of joy. Too. I overshare. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kandan, so could you talk of your, uh, have you had similar experiences with Perumal or with any other ta Tamil author, you know, uh, who, I mean, got what they deserved later or, you know, um, something that you didn't believe in went on to work later for you? So, you know, for Tamil authors, there is no uh, big award like Booker or Nobel that's going to turn their life. The best they can expect would be the Sagiti Academy Award. And that comes usually actually doesn't come until you are 70 or 80. So it's not something you look forward to. I mean, you have to get old to get it. So, so, so that is not something you look forward to. But my, what I can similarly say is that when this, um, when this incident of Permal Murugan happened, when he was under attack in 2014 and 15, that was a moment of intense pressure for us because the writer had withdrawn all his book and he had declared the writer is dead, that I am dead as a writer. Uh, so that was a very intense moment for us. Then later on, a year later, when this uh, Madras High Court came with a brilliant judgment, directly write, saying, telling the writer that to come back and write. So that is one such moment where, you know, that we are waiting anxiously. We are hoping it will be a very positive judgment for us, but still you don't know. But the judgment was not only in his favor, it was almost a literary piece of work where they had quoted, you know, um, uh, opinions on the novel, about the controversy, various aspects of the controversy, and they finally told, had two lines. For the protester, they said, if you don't like the book, don't read it. And for the writer, you should come back and write. That's the end of the judgment. So that was a very important moment for us uh, when that judgment came. Yeah. It's so lovely to see that uh, all three of you are such emotional beings, so emotionally attached to your authors and their work, you know. Uh, like sh uh, being on the other side, when we send our works in, we're saying, who is this person? Do they, does the person look stern? What are they thinking? And all that, right? So, but what are the, could you talk about those complex uh, moments, you know, those, 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 those difficult moments when you, you are torn between uh, who to publish, how to take it forward, you know, some of the angst that you go through. Could you kind of take us through that a, li a little bit, yeah? Let's start with you, yeah. So I can see my colleague Karthik is sitting there and he is smiling, you know. So, <laughs> so we, we go through this almost every day, you know. So it's, it's pretty simple, you know. Uh, we receive a prop proposal, you know, either it comes from a literary agent or we reach out to the author. <laughs> Important thing is that, you know, for fiction, yeah, if one loves, you know, reading that and one is, you know, involved, gets engaged with the work, then probably, you know, uh, for non-fiction, we look at uh, the research, uh, whether that person will be, you know, capable of writing a book. So we look for sample uh, chapters. So it's very clinical, pragmatic in that sense. Uh, I think uh, these are some of the uh, aspects that we look at. So it's not a rocket science, but at the end of the day, you need to identify good writing from bad writing. It's as simple as that. And it's again very subjective. What is good according to me may not be, you know, liked by another person. So truth be told, you know, there is no formula for that, you know. But the real work begins when you receive the manuscript, the final draft of the manuscript the chiseling of the manuscript, writing, rewriting, because a lot of writing is all about rewriting. So from the very beginning, you know, there is a skeleton, a broad structure, 
and by the end of the day when the book is published probably you know it takes a very different you know form altogether alexandra um well it's uh the process is 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 very complicated and completely different from one author to another so what you need to do is find what works for that particular author and so there are some authors for example Carmela Shamsi who as I've said um, in an earlier event um, I met when she was a 21 year old student at university and so and I was a literary agent at the time and I've worked with her ever since so around 30 years and I think because she was still a student and I worked with her on her first novel we've always had a very collaborative relationship so in that case we kind of roll our sleeves up and climb into the novel together and mainly i don't i do publish non-fiction but most of what i've done is fiction in my lifetime and you know we push push it around and i don't think that editing is a prescriptive thing i think of it always as a conversation and you're there as an enabler you're not there to tell authors what is right and what is wrong um, and sometimes I think you can get it wrong as well. Um, and always before I start an editorial session, I, f I have a moment of complete panic. It's as if I'm on the edge of a cliff and I think I know nothing about this book. I can remember the character, not a single character's name. I have no idea what I'm going to say to this author. It's a kind of real Empress no New Clothes moment. But then, and when I start talking, and I start often in quite hesitant ways, and I like to do it face to face, not written down, it, it starts bubbling up, it emerges. So it's a strange, mercurial, slightly magical process, I, I find, with, with, with fiction. Um, but then there are other authors who are brilliant at editing themselves, and there is very, very little that you have to do and then your job is to be the best publisher because it's always important to realize that an editor is not just working on the text. They are the engine behind the book and they have to be involved in every single stage of publication, including getting the cover right, the copy that's on the back cover, getting quotes in from writers, um, and, and taking it out into the world. So the publicity is part of an editor's job as well as the publicist's job. Does that kind of pull your energies down? Do you like doing that? Oh, I love it. I, lo I, I love that. And I've always had a, luckily I'm quite sociable. And I've always had the thing that whenever I go to a party, I want to find at least two people to whom I've talked about a book that I will then send to them. So every party is work, it's not just fun. And I think that at the heart of the best publishing, it should be very passionate and incredibly hard work, but also a lot of fun. It's lovely. Mr. Karnan, would you like to uh, tell us about your... So, uh, the, la the last year itself, we have published about 100 books and we have published across many genres, uh, fiction, academic writing, sociology, history, grammar, science. So, obviously, I can't be the person who can read and decide on everything, um, you know. So, what I do is that I have, I have people who within my, uh, within my company and outside whom I depend on. Uh, to make the selection. Though I am part of the entire process, sometimes I'm, I don't make the decision, but I leave it to an expert to do that. Is this book worth publishing? And then after they say yes, sometimes you can also go for a second person. So it may take some time. And then once they say it's yes, then we always find an expert on that area to work on the book, to edit it for us, to make it more presentable to the readers. And from the cover to the blurb, at every point, I do get involved, but I'm always there as a part of a group making that decision. And wh one of the things is, you, you, and now increasingly, the editor has to sell the book to their colleagues before you get near to, to buying it. And you can go into an editorial meeting feeling really confident that people are going to say yes. I had that with a novel by the writer Deborah Levy. When I was up, I said to the agent, I hope to be making you an offer in a couple of days. And I went into the editorial meeting and all my colleagues just said they hated the book. <laughs> they hated it and they just looked at me and I said, why do you hate it? You know? 
And it was devastating. And, it w and everybody else turned it down. It was published by a small press and it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. So, wow. you know, that's, that's life as an editor. There are ups and downs, quite a few downs. Pravanku, I think uh, you might be able to share something. Mm, she has, well, she has those shared grounds? his bag Have on, you, you know. This happens in uh, every editorial meeting, every week. And uh, yeah, so you know, <coughs> what happens is that you know, you are involved with the project from the very beginning, much before it becomes a book, it's a proposal. And you think that it, uh, it's a gift to the humanity, right? And uh, you become very subjective about it. But over a period of time, I've learned that, you know, one needs to get rid of that problem, you know, if you want, if, if you want to have a stress-free life in publishing, I don't know what it means. <laughs> because I'm also involved in almost everything and I would like to see my cover. I would like to see what's there on the front cover. Maybe, you know, I'd like to change the indent from 1.25 to 1.5 because I disagree with the designer. I would like to see the paper of my book. No, I need 65 GSM, not no 52 GSM. So understand that we editors are, and if I may, a very finicky people. We are nitpickers, and we are expected to do this. So, <laughs> so it's it's quite something. So when I send a proposal in the editorial meeting, it's all my colleagues' chance to nitpick again. And at the end of the day, what we do is that you know is that we are trying to make a good book a better book. And I love that, you know, process, that there is nothing personal here, that we just look at the proposal as it is. But Kalan, I don't think you face these problems because you're the boss man. <laughs> that's, <laughs> true, that's, true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, but still, uh, we, we always try to make the decision as a group. But what I will say is that I don't recommend this for anybody, but my group, the people who have invested in my company, our idea is only to publish good books and we are under no pressure to make a profit. So I don't allow any marketing decision to come into the uh, editorial decision. And that starts only after the book is published, how to market this book. Fantastic. So if the book is going to be published, it's going to be published. So that's how we have worked so far. But again, as I say, I don't recommend this for anybody because it's a dangerous game. <laughs> we wish we had more owners like this. <laughs> Okay, so, um, uh, and also you have a whole team of, uh, each of you has a team of editors and sometimes when you take on a book, uh, they are working on the edit. So, um, have, I mean, could you talk about that whole process of, you know, transferring the baby you've chosen to another person to mentor, to one person in your team to mentor and take it forward? I, I've never much done that, although what I have always done is hire as my assistant um, really clever, I have to say, pretty much all women um, in my <laughs> lifetime in publishing. And when I joined Bloomsbury, the very first assistant I hired was a young woman who hadn't even taken her final exams at Oxford. And I walked into a room, somebody said, you must meet her, I think you get on. She's looking for a job in publishing. And I walked in and I literally, I took one look at her and I kind of knew I would hire her. And her name's Cheeky Saka. And she worked with me for eight years and she was amazing and would do so much of the work um, because I was running the department, publishing my own list of really more books than most editors do between 20 and 30 books a year and also involved in our company in America and then later in India. So without having these women at my side, and I had, I've had generations of them because I've been so long at Bloomsbury, I can't imagine how I could possibly have, have got through my days or my years. Amazing. Uh, Kandan, you said you have a team of editors, of uh, four or five editors, who also work on your magazine and then the books as well. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, a, it's one group. We do both the magazine and the publishing. And uh, so whatever work is there on that day, we will move to that office and work from there. It's a, it's a very close space uh, where we all work together. So that's how it has been. And uh, so at different parts of the year, we'll be focusing on different things. For example, uh, the, 
the Chennai book fair which happens in January is the most important thing for Tamil publishing calendar. So towards the end of the year, especially let's say after the Frankfurt book fair, we'll be completely into books, publishing, getting ready, everything. The entire work done through the whole year would all come together and many books will be published at the end of the year. So that depends on which part of the year it is. Personally, increasingly, I am spending more and more time on rights, buying and selling rights, mostly selling rights. Um, and then I'm leaving many other things to my colleagues uh, who have you know, trained well over the years. Yeah. Lovely. And Pramanko, you too have a team, you said. So we have a big team, first of all. And there are two editors who work with me. So, but what I do is that I largely edit my books. If I'm not able to manage a few books, then I, I don't like to part with my books, truth be told, you know, because they are my babies, honestly. Uh, so, yeah, so what I do is that, you know, and uh, Chiki is my ex colleague, you know, a brilliant publisher. Uh, what we do is that, you know, I, I try to give a full overview of the manuscript to begin with. I, uh, you know, grew up in an academic environment. So I'd like to approach it a bit academically so that after the person goes through the book, I don't ask her to edit, you know. So first she goes through everything and then we share some ideas and every book is unique, you know. So and some books require massive rewriting, but if you do it, then the author's voice is gone. You shouldn't do that. I think the thing about the teams of editors is you want them to take on their own books because you need that sense of, uh, adopt of it being your baby is really, really important. Rather than just foisting something on other people, they have to come to you to say, I want this book. So it's a matter of managing a team and helping to give them confidence, which is really important for editors. And if they don't have it, they don't work well. So I think that that thing of having a team is about that, not about handing them work to do. It's fantastic. What we do is that, if I may uh, add here, is that we do a lot of brainstorming. What kind of books we should do, how we can pitch this book uh, to the market, and how I can excite the people within my organization. Unless I am able to champion the book within the organization, I don't think that, you know, the team as a whole will feel excited about it, to talk about it. Because I don't go to market very often. Uh, but my sales team will go, my marketing team will go, they will interact with media. So I need to pass on that sense of excitement to them. And I think that uh, every editor, and that is very personal opinion that, and because I feel very emotional about it, I think every editor should ideally do that to get engaged, involved with the work, you know? And then there's this entire tussle between the editorial and the marketing team, right? As a journalist who's worked with the Times of India, so you write an article, then the marketing, I've got an idea, pull it out. I said, dude, that we need, that's such a fantastic article and it has to go today, but you know, you've just pulled it out because there's an ad. So do you all have similar tussles with the marketing team? Um, it's part of a publishing life and Years ago, of course, marketing didn't really exist. Um, it was publicity was incredibly important and the sales. But then marketing has become increasingly important and therefore the marketing department increasingly has power within a publishing company. And there's always this push and pull. And I think that, in a, it, I, I think that, that can be creative and good. Um, uh, I think tension is not a bad thing at all. Um, but of course, there are times when you feel that they don't get what you love and, you know, they're not working as hard as they can. And I expect they think uh, about the editors, why do they buy such terrible books? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, this happens uh, regularly, but I think uh, the problem is that uh, an editor is involved with the book much before it becomes a book. So let's understand that. So my engagement with the book is much more emotional. And marketing team has to market 250 books in Penguin, India, a year. And I'm looking at, say, 30, 40, or maybe, you know. But when I look at my backlist, I manage 5,000 books. You know, that's a different thing. But yes, I think it's very important to share the idea of the book from the very beginning so that they are able to engage with the content. 
the moment a person goes through a few chapters maybe or you know then that person will have a very different take on the book rather than a cookie cutter plan that we often see in uh, publicity and marketing yeah. and and um, I, I sometimes of course you i mean you buy a book and they don't you the marketing and the sales department don't want it and you shouldn't on the whole do that because you know you're not going to publish it well but every now and again you do because you're you know stubborn and difficult and i did with a book called eat pray love by elizabeth gilbert because i i just completely fell in love with it nobody else wanted it so i didn't have to pay much money for it and i have to say no one did anything for the book in house or out of house no one wanted to interview her there was one interview which my young stepdaughter gave did for an irish magazine she was just setting up as a journalist it was literally cheeky and i published it together unloved but four years later it went to number one completely on its own it was not from anything we ever did and and it sold nearly two million copies it was just goes to show that however hard you work for books they don't they, they sometimes just work on their own or don't. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Karan, actually, so since you manage both the editorial and the sales, so how do you deal with that tension if there is something at all? No, there is, there is no tension. Like I told you that, I mean, it's not something I'll advise anybody, but the sales marketing have no say in the selection of the book. Um, that's how I, we have framed it. So that, that kind of tension is not there. But what I want to say is that, you know, it is very difficult, different for us from... Um, English publishers or other language publishers in India or uh, in the UK or the US because uh, we, what, we have very small sales relatively on even good books and so we have published many books to do a good turnover per year so we work with very little money, little turnover on big projects. So the amount of work we put in may not be very different but the returns are much much smaller so that means we have to work with a small team on a large number of books so the way we handle it is much different that we cannot assign one editor to this number of books which you have to do this year. That kind of system is not possible, then I will need my many more editors which I can't afford. So we essentially work with what we have. And we are very ambitious, so we always punch up our weight and do many books. Finally, though we plan every year that we won't do so many books, but as the year goes by, you know, it goes beyond our, little bit beyond our control and we end up doing many books. So the system of working is, I'll say, very different for Tamil, from English or maybe even Malayalam. Every Indian language is its own ecosystem, you know. It's completely different from other lang languages and it has formed because of their own tradition and how, you know, the publishing has evolved in, the, in their own language. So, that, so that's so idealistic and it's so incredible given that, you know, we live in such a corporate world that you're able to, you know, be the torchbearer of good writing. I just heard Meena Kandaswamy saying, when are you publishing me? So, you know, uh, so it's... it's so what does it take? I mean, are you able to make money back or is it? So we, we obviously don't make losses because we won't be here then. We are here for 25 years. But I will say that as a private debit company, we have never declared profit so far. Then it's just purely from the heart huh? for the love of literature. That's lovely. Okay. Uh, so Alexander, you were t talking about how um, in the UK, you don't um, take unsolicited manuscripts it comes through an agent. Mm. Uh, whereas in India, they also, you know, you can approach the publisher directly. Yes. So, yeah. Well, I think the, the big change that happened in publishing was the advent of email. Because until then, um, a manuscript had to be photocopied and it had to be, and a letter had to be typed and it, the, ma the manuscript had to be put into a parcel and taken to the post office. And so agents or anyone would just send to one editor at a time or two or three at the most because it was expensive and time consuming. Then with the advent, and so we always used to look at what we call the slush pile. Um, all publishers did. But with the advent of email, it meant that agents could literally send one manuscript to like 60 editors in, in one moment. And therefore your inbox is flooded with submissions just from agents, let alone from people who don't have agents. So you literally, and editors have to do their reading at nights and at weekends, and they're editing, they maybe can take a day a week, but otherwise you're in the office and you're doing the business of publishing. 
So it's really hard to find the time to do the reading. And you don't get much help. And publishers have cut back on having readers. I had an amazing reader who worked for me two days a week through all my career, so I was very lucky. But she couldn't possibly get through everything that was sent just from agents. So publishers have had to stop looking at unsolicited manuscripts because it's physically impossible to get through. And that's why I always say to people who are, want to be writers, who, people who are writing, get an agent in the UK and the US. Uh, it's different in different countries, and I know that in Europe, like in France, there are hardly any agents, and publishers do the work of agents themselves, but in the UK, you have to have one. Uh, Pramanko, could you talk about how, I mean, in India too, there are agents, but then how is it working with you all? Do you publish more authors who approach you directly, or have you been, how's the list kind of building up now? So yeah, uh, in India there are very few agents, uh, they do submit manuscripts to us, but in India I think uh, organic publishing is encouraged more because that's what every publishing houses look for. Uh, we are expected to reach out to the authors or we, sh we are expected to develop an idea. So these two things work, so I think in India agent uh, literary agency hasn't haven't taken off yet the way it has happened in the UK but it's there but m mostly here we like to reach out to the authors directly and what about new authors uh, could you please uh, what about uh, debut authors who ha who you don't know about how will you reach out to them well, there are many debut authors you know we reach out to it's not like that you know we don't distinguish you know so we are chasing a good book, understand that. So that is very important for us. Doesn't matter whether that person has written or not before. So it's like that. There are many people whose books we brought out for the first time. And that book became a big hit. Gaur Kopal Das, for example, I think we published his book for the first time. He was a debut author. I'm just talking about one author in the commercial space. But there are literary authors, even in the non-fiction also. Akshay Mukul is a classic example, whose first book was published by HarperCollins, I think, in 2014-15, and it got all the awards uh, in India. So it's like that. So you all are incredible people wearing multiple hats and doing so much, <laughs> yeah? And um, so, uh, Alexandra, so you were talking about, you know, um, uh, literary fiction and uh, you know we were discussing how I like reading um, you know books I've heard every story before so to me about it's about the stylistic and the literary uh, appeal of the book right so how do you deal with I mean uh, uh, could you talk about some of the uh, creative works that have come under you that you have sort of uh, groomed and which are some of the best books some examples of what uh, I I don't know. I mean, there, I've published so many books, and um, you know, each of them is their own kind of precious thing. But I, I also sort of feel it's not the editor's job to talk about really too much about what they do because we should be behind the scenes, and the star is the author. And um, uh, you know, so I, I don't like to say, you know, this is this person is this person because of me because I think it's it's really is is all, all about them um, and uh, uh, but but also you know we we make we make real mistakes as well uh, as in uh, sometimes in the editing we can say the wrong things we can upset authors we you know it's such a delicate thing and um, and I feel that editors should just be on the whole not in public <laughs> you know they should be beh beh behind the scenes yeah, Kanan, with all that, you know, uh, happened with Perumal Murugan and, you know, you you took on something that was also went on to become controversial, you know, so, um, and of course you've dealt with that whole editorial, so how did you, I mean, could you talk about that uh, part of your life? Uh, so Pe Perumal's books you took on and it went on to be controversial, it's writing is spectacular, I've read the translations in English, although I can't read it in the, in the Tamil. But obviously you've taken on, made a bold move to kind of publish that and you know, um, there's a lot of literary appeal to his writing. So could you talk about 
his lit the literary appeal of his work and to uh, maintaining the sanctity of that work as an editor and the whole and how the tamil industry functions and where it's read because it's also read outside of a few uh, in in a few other countries other than india yeah so you know Hello. Yeah. So, um, Permal Murugan's controversy became very big, very international. So, therefore, many people heard about the controversy. But for us, that is not the first controversy. Since we publish um, books and magazines, we are always under some kind of attack because the politicians might be upset, uh, leading writers may, might be upset about something, or the. We have a lot of cultural guardians in Tamil. They might be upset, uh, you know, upset about something. For example, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we had a new wave of women writing. And poets like Salma, Malti, Maitri, Sukhidrani, they started writing about their sexuality and their body. And that created really a big uproar and a lot of attack on them. And there's a documentary on YouTube you can watch which says, She Write, about their controversy. That, that happened 20 years ago. Then again, we know we stood by the writers and we had organized a meeting for them. And we, our stand is very clear that, you know, that nobody can uh, control the writer and we will not stop publishing because somebody does not like it. But if the writers now, in this context, writers have started self-censorship a lot, which I can see. And so that is a different question. But I myself, I never uh, do it. We will publish. And we will stand with the writers. So that's, that has been our portion always. I think publishers have to take that very strong portion. Otherwise, you know, we will easily give in to the uh, political atmosphere uh, and give in to writers. Because every community has wants to project a certain imagination of themselves, you know, certain image of themselves. Every religion wants to do that. Every language, culture wants to do that. And when writers about the underbelly of things, you know, how things were in the past or the, neg the darker side of society, Nobody likes it. So, uh, but writers can't stop doing that. So I think we, as publishers, we have to very strongly stand with writers and help them publish what they like. And also, um, uh, uh, could you elaborate a bit on where Tamil is read, you know, in nations outside India? Yeah. So yeah, so though we are, we are based in a small town in the southern tip of India, we see ourselves as an international Tamil publisher because we do get manuscripts from across the world today, from all the continents and we select and publish uh, writers internationally. And so I, that's how we work. So like she said, the email changed the whole thing. Before that, you know, when I, when I came to publishing, I felt the relationship between publishers and writers was very feudal in Tamil. That publishers held all the power to make our, uh, you know, writer. So first thing I said was, please don't come to meet me because that is not an equal meeting. So don't come to meet me, always courier the manuscript or email the manuscript now. And after we select and we, if there is a requirement, then we will meet and we will discuss. But there is no need to pay respects to me to get the book published, you know. So that is something I've always been very firm about. Some people have been a little upset about that, that I don't meet them. But like she said, no, we have to be in the background. We don't have to be, you know, out there. But if there's a need to meet the writer, to edit, to work with them, then we will, uh, you know, form that relationship. But like I said, we can always meet and work with the writers if you are on an equal footing. But I think that will happen in the future when we'll be able to freely meet writers, when they have many options to publish, and then we can go and talk to them on an equal footing, then it's all good. But th right now, this is my policy that you don't have to come and pay respects to me to get your book published. We will do it purely on the base of the text, and then we can always meet anytime we want. So amazing. Um, and uh, we were also discussing, you know, uh, how authors uh, are using uh, publicists or agents to kind of promote their work, right? So, Ale Alexander, you had a take on that, you know, on... Uh um, yes, I, um, some authors employ freelance publicists to work on their books, which is absolutely fine, and there are many very good, good ones. But in an ideal world, you want the publicist to be working in the company because it's part of the organic growth of a book and the energy of it and the excitement of it in-house. And you want everyone working together and talking with each other. So the publicist is talking to the marketing person, the salesperson. So much of publishing is about conversations and 
Um, I think one of the sadnesses of, of COVID and working um, at, you know, at a distance from each other is that we've missed those conversations and it's become less creative um, as a result. Um, and having a publicist in house is part of that creativity. That's all. Oh. <laughs>